Cambridge Insider Podcast time again. Hello, everybody, and thank you for tuning in. Thank you for listening. Thank you for subscribing. Thank you for leaving fan mail for Mr. Craig Batson. <laughs> Craig Batson, out of Seattle. How are you, buddy? I am doing good today. It is, um, you know, a nice morning here. I'm just jazzed. Uh, we recorded a nice pod the other day, and I'm happy to roll on that. Absolutely. Did you did you receive any fan mail? I have not yet. I'm still waiting. I'm glad we're putting it at the top of the the top of the mod because I don't know if everybody listens to the very end, and so that might have been my problem. Yeah. Craig dot batson at cambridgenetwork.com go ahead send questions comments anything absolutely and share the podcast it's uh, some valuable information important topic that we're talking about today but before we do that i want to introduce our special very special guest uh mr dennis Wu. uh dennis how are you buddy i'm doing well fellas thank you so much for having me awesome awesome to have you on you're a you're a man of many talents um <laughs> officially your title is uh, you're a marketing and communication specialist, but I just sort of seeing you see you as sort of the guy that heads up a lot of the communication that school partners receive, um, a lot of the marketing information that we do work work on uh, from the Cambridge side sort of goes through your channels as well. Do you want to maybe just take a, a moment and just introduce yourself and a little bit of your role to our listeners? Sure. Yeah, that was um, you know a, a good intro, and uh, for me, I. You know, for in Cambridge, I am the marketing support person, um, and I support various functions cross departmentally. Um, and then also, I, I handle a lot of the external communication, like you mentioned, to schools, to host families. So, I really are corporate level communication that goes out, whether that's email um, or social media. Um, basically, you know, all of the really pertinent, high level information um, that we need communicated to our stakeholders. Um, probably touches my hands at some point. So that's awesome. what I do here at Cambridge. Awesome. So schools, you are indebted to to Dennis because he's the guy that uh, a lot of that, that uh, like he says, that high level important information that you're receiving, whether that be over email or through a newsletter, uh, that's often coming through Dennis. So Dennis, thank you for for what you do there. Um, all right, help me out, Joe. We're talking. We're talking vaccines. You've been um, you've been at the forefront of this from a Cambridge side in terms of keeping your eye on what's happening, how this rollout has been, uh, what's new in that world. How can we help our school partners understand where we are a little better? Yeah, that's the big question for everybody, right? Um, you know, around the world and definitely here um, in the U.S. is when can I get vaccinated? Um, and you know, the other thing to roll in here is school safety and school reopening as well. So um, before we get to that question, I'd really um, want to provide some context. And this is really important for our stakeholders, um, our schools, our families, our um, our hosts. Um, so, you know, to provide some big context, first, we should go back to um, the presidential address um, by the Biden administration that happened last week, I believe it was on March 11th. Um, he, in his address to the nation, um, you know, he made COVID vaccination, um, you know, a, a top priority, um, saying that the general public should um, have full eligibility by uh, May 1st. Um, although there are some caveats to that, um, he also reaffirmed his commitment to fully reopening K through eight schools um, by the end of his first hundred days in office. Um, and that mark is probably around the end of April. Um, and then the other big thing um, that happened in the news was the passing of the American um, Rescue Plan. So, um, you know, before we get to the big question of when can international students and when can schools, um, you know, when can international students get vaccinated and when can schools fully reopen? Um, we need to see what the, you know, cover these um, topics first. So, um, you know, today marks a really big benchmark. Um, the goal that the Biden administration um, set forth was 100, uh, vac 100 million vaccinations within the first 100 days. And we're about 40 days um, ahead of schedule. And today we've um, passed that mark. I believe we're at 109 million um, vaccinations. Um, that's great news. That's about a third um, of our population. And so we're, we're taking really um, big steps in the right direction. From a school awesome. safety and reopening um, standpoint, with the passing of the American Rescue Plan, 
um, that allocated uh, almost $130 billion um, for school um, reopening and uh, safe in-person instruction. And that will get that money will get uh, distributed by the Department of Education later this month. Um, this money uh, and these dollars are going to help schools pay for critical supplies. Um, you know, according to the CDC um, recommendations for uh, mitigation strategies within schools, allow schools to hire more staff, avoid any layoffs or cutting of their current staff, and also accommodate the need for smaller classrooms due to social distancing and physically spacing apart um, desks and things like that, as well as um, additional support for academics, um, social and emotional needs, and such a challenging, difficult year. I love it. I love it. I just want to I just want to recap there because I think you've given so much important context, so much important information there. From what I heard, correct me if I'm wrong, really positive steps from the administration in terms of not only rolling the the vaccines out and making sure that we are getting, as I've heard in the media of late, like more shots in arms. This is important. This is very important for our industry, as everybody can imagine. Even just when the vaccine started rolling out in the initial phases from the industry standpoint, we saw that interest start to perk up again. People saying, hey, maybe this is a, a travel destination. Maybe this is an educational travel destination for me. So that's really important. Um, and that seems to continue to be the main goal is let's get as many people vaccinated, open up the country. Um, the second part of what I heard you say was was something that I actually didn't know about was this commitment of uh, an extensive amount of, of, of dollars towards helping schools and supporting schools outside of vaccinations to make sure that they are able to open, able to open safely, able to have the resources to continue uh, providing a really quality service, looking after their teachers, their staff, their administrators, and more importantly, um, their students. So these two things I feel like are so, so important. Did I miss something there? Or those two really the two yeah. big channels? Yeah, that's a great summary um, of that. The other two points that I would add are that um, teacher uh, vaccination um, eligibility has opened up across the country. Um, I believe as of this week, uh, 48 out of the 50 states, and it might even be the entire country now, teachers are now eligible um, and, uh, you know, to, to get vaccinated there. Um, you know, in, in a lot of um, states their phases of eligibility um, and teachers are either the second or third um, group that is now available um, and that will be a huge step um, towards getting everybody um, in the school uh, vaccinated and uh, safely reopening uh, schools so one other thing that we didn't touch upon um, is testing um, the uh, the bill that was just passed also awards uh, over $600 million of an investment um, towards uh, COVID testing um, in schools. So uh, not only is vaccination important, but continued uh, consistent testing in schools will also help reopen our schools and keep them open um, uh, you know, throughout this process as well, um, identifying the existing testing capacity um, and supporting um, that as well. Awesome, awesome, awesome stuff. Um, where are we? I feel like the next question is, and, and Mr. Batson, I see you unmuted yourself, so so you know, I'm going to get to you now, but where are we? The next logical question for me would be all of these things are going full steam ahead. Where are we with students and students? Uh, I, I think students as sort of uh, children being able to get vaccinated just as a whole. And then I think the next logical question again should be international students. What is the expectation there? for them being able to have access to the vaccine. Yeah, absolutely. Um, for those of you that have kept up with coronavirus vaccine news, you probably know that there are three vaccines currently approved for emergency use authorization. Um, the first um, two are Pfizer and Moderna, and more recently the Johnson & Johnson one dose uh, vaccine. Um, those are available across the country um, now, and um, Based on CDC guidelines, two of those, um, the Moderna and the Johnson & Johnson, are already approved for, um, you know, the general public 18 and older. So that includes some of our high school population, um, seniors, um, you know, uh, mostly. Uh, but the Pfizer vaccine has actually been uh, authorized for anybody above the age of 16, um, you know. It depends on eligibility, but it is 
already determined that it's safe for uh, anybody that is over that age. Uh, more testing is going to be required for uh, the younger population, uh, 16 and under, and they usually do it in steps. Um, vaccine development typically happens first with um, adults, then late teens, and then um, preteens, and then um, the youngest population and babies. So it typically flows um, in that kind of um, progress. And, um, you know, people might be asking the question, and we can touch upon it a little bit later, um, but is the vaccine generally different? The easiest answer would be no. The vaccine fundamentally isn't different for the age groups. It's really about the dosage. Um, so they need to test that and make sure what that you know, optimal amount would be for each of these age groups. Um, you know, to get into your question, um, Dr. Fauci in a recent interview did uh, give a rough timeline of when he expected all high school students to be um, vaccinated and then also uh, a rough timeline of when the younger um, elementary and middle school age students um, you know, could get vaccinated. So initially, I think the timeline um, he, he gave was spring and summer, um, and then later pushed that back to the fall. We're actually seeing that that may be slightly earlier. I think he was, uh, the administration was being cautious in, in defining those, um, you know, those guidelines. Like I mentioned, um, since the vaccine, uh, the Pfizer vaccine is currently authorized for um, students um, and, um, young people ages 16 and up. We've seen that uh, vaccine rollout actually occurring in some states already. Um, places like uh, Mississippi and Alaska, we've seen 16 year olds, 17 year olds, uh, 18 year old students already to begin getting vaccinated. And Mississippi actually opened up um, their eligibility to anybody above the age of uh, 16. So um, in places where I would say that's less densely populated, where there's um, less of a demand vaccine rollout has gone a little bit more smoothly and now we're seeing if that state has enough of the Pfizer vaccine they're rolling it out to to those students and that will allow schools to um, open up maybe a little bit quicker um, and things to kind of get back to uh, a degree of normalcy. Um, we've also seen with this commitment um, and push by the Biden administration that other states are um, quickly um, following in suit um, in the coming weeks and in opening up their um, eligibility to residents, uh, state residents above the age of 16. Michigan, uh, Connecticut, starting right at the first week of April, eligibility will open up to um, any residents. Um, and that's, you know, keeping a international education um, perspective in mind, as long as you're a resident in that state, um, you'll you'll have uh, the same eligibility and if eligibility opens up for your age group then you um, will then be able to to get a vaccine in your state so um, you know while we're keeping the definitions of international student versus domestic domestic students are different needs and obviously we we understand that um, in, in our industry um, but for this case really you know there there isn't a distinguishable distance between um, you know, a student, an American student, and a, um, you know, a study abroad student in this case. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Mr. Batson, any questions from your side? I know you've been listening eagerly on the side. I don't want to, I don't want to blow you out of this, um, out of this conversation completely. Honestly, this has been great. Dennis has been delivering some, uh, like awesome news. And I think the question that I would have is, you know, as a marketing expert, uh, what can our schools do to capitalize on this news to make themselves more attractive in China? Yeah, I think, you know, if schools within these states, and I, and I believe more and more states will open up, um, Arizona and other states are following um, the May 1st um, threshold or or, or set date that the Biden administration um, provided to opening up to the general public. So, um, you know, I think that that's a real great target date that's actually still within this school year, um, which makes the promises of next school year uh, being closer to normal, a much more real possibility. Um, I think the important thing for schools is one, to communicate um, 
you know, current news, the latest news and updates to uh, their entire community, uh, both domestic and their um, international students, as well as prospective students that may be, um, you know, eyeing to come to America, but they're hesitant or unsure of what, um, you know, what the pandemic and um, its effects are on the schools and the communities that they would like to uh, be in. So that's information. More information is always great. Um, the other thing that schools um, and um, you know students alike should know or that it should be communicated within these stakeholders are that even after the vaccine, um, you know, students should be if, uh, expected to follow their school safety protocols. Um, we know the CDC has handled, um, has given out a bunch of information about um, even if you're vaccine, uh, you're vaccinated, you're not quite sure if it's transmissible or not. Um, you still have to follow, um, you know, mass mandates uh, and safety protocols. So if a student is vaccinated or you're close to being vaccinated, the expectation should be set that, you know, it still uh, may or may not be required to wear masks, to get tested regularly and practice social distancing for the remainder of the year um, or even into um, parts of next year, just depending on, you know, how quickly we can return to a uh, normal and how quickly we can get everyone vaccinated. So, um, you know, and also not to hesitate, I think educating um, their staff and their students and also, um, you know, really um, trying to get every as many people vaccinated as quickly as possible while still maintaining those safety guidelines. This is really important for schools to communicate. Awesome. Awesome. I love what you're saying there. It's something that we've been communicating for some time to our school partners, trying to get them to communicate more. Um, I think more concisely and more specifically with the international population, with the international students and families. You know, oftentimes schools are, are releasing information or releasing communication and it's just general. And I think many of our international population have some of these questions that we've discussed today and, and want to know from the school, from a head of school or a president, you know, what, how does this affect me as an international student? Is it different? Is it the same? So that concise communication um, is really, really important. Mr. Dennis Koo, thank you so much. Uh, tons of just really, really useful information um, that I think continues to be a part of this positive trend that we're sort of seeing. Um, great news for the industry, great news for schools and for prospective students. So, uh, you know, we we appreciate you being the bearer of really good news. Any final yeah. thoughts that you want to uh, that you want to share with uh, either myself or Craig or just our listeners in sure. general? Absolutely. I have one um, last tidbit of good news um, for everyone. Um, the testing for younger students um, ages 12 to 17 and even younger have uh, begun. Um, Moderna announced this week that they're giving their first doses of the Corona um, um, vaccine to uh, children younger than um, 12 years old. The company also launched a trial um, for students 12 to uh, 17 in December um, and we anticipate results of those studies happening sometime uh, in the summer. Pfizer also announced that uh, they've be finished uh, enrolling participants in trials for teenagers 12 to 15. So more good news um, is on the horizon, hopefully, um, for these younger um, populations. So um, underclassmen uh, in high school as well as um, late middle school uh, students. So, um, and even um, the director of the Gamble uh, and Vaccine Research Center and the um, principal investigator on the Pfizer vaccine trial um, has um, stated that they probably will get a vaccine license for all kids um, above 12 um, before the 2021-2022 uh, school year. So sometime um, in this before the end of the summer um, as well. So, um, you know, hopefully, you know, in the coming months, we'll have all um, high school students eligible um, to be vaccinated in one way or another. So um, more good news, hopefully on the way, but there are still some uh, trials and research that needs to be done. Awesome, awesome. I feel like we, and I, I know it's been coming, but I feel like we're really, really close to a, a complete, you know, sort of shift and turnaround. We've seen a lot of positive news and I think, you know, having the trials in, in, in students of, of those ages specifically or in children of those ages is going to be a really a breakthrough moment for, for this entire fight against this pandemic. Mr. Craig Betson, um, any final thoughts, any final questions, any final ideas that you want to share uh, on this beautiful Friday afternoon? We're recording on a Friday for all of our listeners. I just, uh, if we have Dennis every week, I, who knows if I need to be here? You know, this is, 
this is that was jam packed full of news. I feel like I'm being replaced already. You know, I feel like I usually provide the information and and now we have, you know, Dennis doing. Oh, sorry. Y you provide the information. Um, I mean, we you could have just we, gone with we, we. we. I, I'm sorry. I forget. My wife always tell me I we me. Uh, I forget what it is again. Um, no, I think I think that was really good. And I think it let's be hopeful. Right. You know, we've we've. We've been beaten down a lot. You know, Dennis has a lot of good news for the industry and for America in general um, that I think this is, you know, going to be very important for us. So I'm, you know, really excited. Absolutely. Absolutely. To all the school officials listening, you're smarter now than you were. Um, smarter, <laughs> maybe smarter is not the right word. You're more informed now than you were, you know, 20 minutes ago. Uh, we provide up to date, cutting edge information that's going to make you and your international program better that's going to help you to serve your students and your international community better like subscribe share do all of those wonderful things that we need you to do reach out with any questions if you do have specific ones and we will catch you around the next episode of the cambridge insider podcast bye bye everybody